Hi, guys. Um, my name is Cindy George. Um, and just by way of introduction, I will tell you that I was chrismated into the Orthodox faith in 2008. Um, and I am a very grateful member of St. Matthew Parish. Overwhelming gratitude for that parish. Um, in North Royalton, Ohio. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in nursing. I have um, a master's in Christian ministry degree from my Protestant days. Um, and then I have a, a master's in applied Orthodox theology um, from the University of Belmont through the St. Stephen's program. And I am currently a board member for Zoe for Life, the Orthodox pro-life ministry in Parma, Ohio. And the, my talk today is communion through obedience, ministering to those in crisis pregnancy. <clears throat> I will tell you that crisis pregnancy has been one of the lenses through which God has revealed to me the necessity for and the benefit of obedience. There have been many of these kinds of lenses throughout my life, but for some reason crisis pregnancy is still one ministry in which I still battle. A couple of years ago, one of our dear friends gave my husband a birthday card that I thought summed up so well about my relationship with crisis pregnancy ministry. You didn't choose the stud life, she says. <laughs> <laughs> it chose you. That's me and crisis pregnancy ministry. I did not choose this line of work. It truly um, chose me. God first used pregnancy choices. That is um, a crisis pregnancy center ministry in Canton, Ohio, to demonstrate to me my spiritual short-sightedness as well as the spiritual reality that he is made perfect in my weakness. I had always thought that the reason that I was uncomfortable in the pregnancy center ministry is because I could not relate with the clients. My whole adult life, for the most part, has been one of ministering to and with those who shared a similar path, a kind of a similar brokenness. We had the same or comparable wounds. And as he often does, God has used this reality over and over to heal me. It's kind of the whole wounded healer kind of concept. Crisis pregnancy doesn't fit that mold for me, or at least I thought. As St. Boniface, the 8th century British saint, has said, the fear of God is the father of attention, and attention is the mother of inner peace. I also like appreciate this familial thing he's got going on, kind of um, along the same lines as pregnancy center ministry. The fear of God is the father of attention, and attention is the mother of inner peace, which gives birth to a conscience which enables the soul to see its deformity as in a kind of clear and still water. And so are born the beginnings and roots of repentance. It seems that the more aware I am of my own wounds, the more repentance I experience. And the more repentance I experience, the more I can see and understand my own soul deformities, as well as the soul deformities of others. Praxis of the Orthodox tradition leads me ever further into the fear of God and subsequently ever deeper into repentance, which means that I have seen or at least I have gotten glimpses of the depravity of my own soul. And although I have not found myself in a crisis pregnancy, at least not yet, <laughs> I am broken in many of the same areas as our clients. Our clients come to us in a state of sexual brokenness, and that brokenness I know. I know it well. This type of brokenness exhibits in just a panoply of forms, and it goes right to the noose, to the very core of who we are, who we were created to be, male and female created in the image of God, and it distorts that. It clouds and distorts our very identity the way in which we relate with others, and certainly the way in which we relate to God. 
and I relate to those types of wounds. And so I minister out of my brokenness, and God shines through the cracks in my clay pot. So, as in most things in my life, this is going to be at least as much about me as it is about crisis pregnancy. And I know that you know that when we minister to others, we minister out of all of who we are. We call it crisis pregnancy or pregnancy support ministry, but there is so much more to it than the name implies. Crisis pregnancy or pregnancy center ministry is not just about pregnancy. It's not just about babies. And it is certainly not just about not aborting. Pregnancy center ministry is about life. Certainly, it's about the life of the preborn, but that's not all it's about. You know, so many people who know that I'm in this ministry, and I have been for years and years, assume that I'm in it because I love babies. <laughs> well, I do. I mean, they're cute, they're cuddly, but I don't love babies any more than I love 100-year-olds, you know. Um, I do particularly love this baby, however. <laughs> that is our granddaughter, little Evie. <laughs> Certainly I love her. <laughs> yes, who wouldn't? <laughs> and our baby Henry getting his first haircut. <laughs> That's where I get my haircut. That's it. <laughs> yeah, just like that. Yeah. I, I pay the same amount. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem right, does it? <laughs> So pregnancy center ministry isn't just about babies, no matter how cute they are. Um, and it isn't about um, just the life of the mother. It's also about the life of everyone connected with the pregnancy, the father, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the brothers, the sisters. But it's even more <clears throat> than that. Just like everything else, it seems, um, we limit God. We don't know how not to. Um, or maybe that's just me. <laughs> but when I first got into crisis pregnancy ministry, I also um, labored under this false assumption that pregnancy ministry was about babies. But it isn't. It certainly is. But it's about so much more. It's about life. And it is about life to the fullest, the reason that Christ came. This is actually a big part of the realization my work in pregnancy ministry has taught me, and which has led me into a deeper and richer communion with the lover of our souls and, as the psalmist says, the lifter of our heads. So while I love cuddling babies, particularly that one, um, <clears throat> And whether or not I enjoy doing that, of course I do. Whether or not um, I have ever been pregnant myself, whether or not I am passionate about or even comfortable laboring in pregnancy center ministry is not the issue. The issue is what John 10.10, 10, this latter part of that verse tells us. Christ came so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. Sexual brokenness. And certainly abortion is the antithesis of abundant life. The realization of this makes me responsible and accountable to God and to others who suffer from these wounds. St. Theophon the Recluse said, Throw out of your head the idea that you can, through a comfortable life, become all you must be in Christ. This has been so impactful to me that I remember, it's like the Kennedy assassination, I remember where I was when I read it. Mm -hmm. You know, it really impacted my life, and it has become the mantra for me this year. It just applies to a whole lot of things in my life. It's actually the reason I opted to do this workshop. So at the time I initially read this, uh, I was weighing a request from my priest, whom I love, to be the parish council chairperson. It was already a stretch for me to be on the council. That's just not something I enjoy. Um, I'd much rather minister one-on-one -on -one and go to liturgy and enjoy the liturgy. I don't want to hear what everybody else has to say about the budget and all that kind of stuff. And he had asked me if I would at least consider um, being the parish council chair. I love my parish, as I told you, St. Matthew Parish. It's a wonderful parish. So not only did I have to consider, did I want to be the chair of the parish, it was after this had happened to our beloved church. Mm 
We had been devastated by a fire that completely annihilated the church and ruined the, um, the fellowship hall. So, um, obviously, it was a time of rebuilding, fundraising, all of that stuff I'm not comfortable with. Um, I no more wanted to do this than I wanted to cut off my right arm. St. Theophon the Recluse, throw out of your head the idea that you can, through a comfortable life, become all you must be in Christ. Needless to say, I am almost a year into serving um, in that capacity, and it has been a wonderful experience. We, it's just been a wonderful experience. God, as our priest said the day after the fire happened, God will help us. We'll be all right. He has, and we, and we are. A well-placed revelation from a recognized saint changed the course of my life. So I quickly began to see its implications in other areas of my life, specifically Zoe for life. The Orthodox Pregnancy Center um, that I told you about. Pregnancy support ministry, as I mentioned before, has long been a method that God uses to grab my attention and call me to repentance and to transform me. It is part of my path to salvation. So, like I said before, kind of ironic, as an RN and as a woman, it is nothing with which I have any kind of experience. No academic or experiential knowledge with this. In fact, until I serendipitously ended up working in a pregnancy center, um, it was nothing to which I had even given any thought to. Um, And that has been about 16 years ago. And this ministry was then and still is a barometer for measuring my fidelity to God as well as my obedience to him. And like I said, it remains for me to this day an area in which I am not comfortable. And yet, in orthodox fashion, God keeps calling me to it again and again. So if you just bear with me a minute, I want to tell you um, the story of how I first got involved with this. I'll give you something a little more fun than me to look at while I do this. (laughs) I had been um, in various management positions in nursing for 15 or 20 years. And I was looking for a job, and a friend of mine told me about a place that was looking for a part-time Christian nursing manager. And I thought, well, shoot, that's me. I'm a Christian. I'm a nursing manager. This, is, this job was written for me. I had no idea what it was, just knew it was in Christian ministry. It wasn't until I went to talk to the executive director that I discovered it was a, a crisis pregnancy center. Now, I have to admit, I had, like I said, I had no interest in that kind of work, um, but I loved mission work, and I wanted to work in Christian ministry full-time, and I thought, well, we can start here and see what God does with this. So we agreed on a position, and I, then I took another part-time job at a local hospital to supplement my income. So obviously, I can't. I can't stand up here and tell you, I can't tell anybody that my accepting that position was an act of obedience on my part. It wasn't. It was an act of convenience um, and necessity. I saw it as a stepping stone to something more, or something more I was more comfortable with, something that was up my alley. But the Lord tells us in Isaiah that his thoughts are not our thoughts, and our ways are not his ways. He tells us in verse 9, But as heaven is distant from the earth, so is my way distant from your ways and your thoughts from my mind. Mm -hmm. And he has proved that abundantly. I had a friend send me this recently on my phone, (laughs) and I thought, this is it exactly. God says, I have a plan for your life, and the Holy Spirit's having a ball, and I am petrified. (laughs) And I just hang on for the ride. (laughs) So I will tell you, it was at that hospital job, my second job that was going to supplement this income until I could find something that I was more comfortable with, where I met my now husband. Um, who was a practicing radiologist. I'm happy to tell you now he is a retired radiologist. (laughs) And he agreed to read for free the ultrasounds that we would be doing at the pregnancy center on abortion-minded and abortion-vulnerable women. I might also add that it was through that wonderful husband of mine, I can never say this, um, that I was introduced to and came into the Orthodox faith. 
So I have a whole lot to be grateful for from him, not just the fact that he fixed this for me. (laughs) So up until a few years after our marriage, um, I was still a very proud evangelical um, Protestant. Now I am a repentant Orthodox sinner and has completely changed my life. So even though my motives may have been less than pure and my obedience less than strict, God richly blessed this ministry and he gave me grace upon grace to do the job that was before me. I remember um, when I... When I started this the the, the job, um, I do this for free now. But when I started the job, um, I was asked to be on a national board. And lest my ego get all puffed up, my qualification was that I knew I didn't know what I was doing, and I had to rely on God. His ways are not my ways. So um, after working at the center for several years, it was time for me to leave. Um, and when I left. I kept nothing from that center because I knew that I was done with that ministry. But pregnancy center ministry, at least for me, is not unlike grown children, or at least what my dad used to say, we're boomerangs. We throw it out and it keeps coming back, and that was the case for me, it boomeranged. I had been safely retired for several years when the president of Zoe for Life asked me if I would be willing to attend a board meeting. Zoe for Life is a Christian ministry which affirms the value of life by helping women in a confidential manner during and after crisis pregnancies. We are committed to providing care, support, and education to empower women to make decisions everyone can live with. It had been around, by this time it had been around for several years, as Zoe House, a material support ministry, and they were looking to branch out into a medical model in hopes of reaching more women. So, sure, I said, I can attend a board meeting. She knew my past. She knew what I had done before. And I thought, well, maybe if I can lend a hand, I will do that. I had not yet learned the lesson that when God calls me to something, it is for my own salvation. So I attended the board meeting. I'll, as you've already know, uh, one meeting led to another meeting until another, until one day the board president asked if I could accept, the, if I would accept the board position. I don't know how many of you know Paula. She is the, um, the president of Zoe for Life, and she is not a woman that you say no to. Um, she is so dedicated, um, so in love with this ministry, with the Lord, um, you, wouldn't, you just wouldn't dare say no. You want to go along for the ride. So, and because by this time it had also been revealed to me about um, <clears throat> crisis pregnancy ministry that that was truly the heart of God. And because, like I told you, it was important to throw out of your head the idea that you can, through a comfortable life, become all you must be in Christ. Um, I said yes. Metropolitan Callistos Ware <clears throat> says in his book, The Orthodox Church, that grace is not a gift from God. He says, grace is a direct manifestation of the living God himself, a personal encounter between the creature and the creator. I have experienced this grace. I have experienced God's actual manifestation through some of the most surprising ways. Through the ministry of crisis pregnancy, God has revealed to me that abortion is not a political issue. It is a spiritual issue. And as I mentioned before, it is not just about babies, although it certainly affects them. Um, Abortion, um, they don't survive that. But it also affects the mother, the father, the grandparents, the uncles, the aunts, the brothers, the sisters, everyone and anyone who has never had the opportunity to meet the life that was lost to this world. I did not know that until I began work in this ministry. I was completely blind to that. Not just that, but even the deeper truths that I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Pregnancy Center Ministry has made me sensitive to these things and to many other things. It actually quickened my spirit to the things that are important to the Spirit of God. In 1973, 
Father John Mayendorf of Blessed Memory stated that it is the orthodox belief that human life begins at the moment of conception. He further stated that all who hold life sacred and worthy of preservation whenever possible are obliged at all costs to defend the lives of the unborn children, regardless of the stage of their embryonic development. He did not qualify that to say, to the degree that you are comfortable, defend the lives of the unborn, nor did he say if it's convenient or if it's up your alley or if you feel qualified or called. And we could add to that that we are obliged at all costs to defend life, certainly of the unborn. I mean, it should at least begin there, right? The most innocent among us. But of life in general, um, life to the fullest, as intended by Jesus Christ. Remember, the first part of John 10.10 states that the thief comes only to kill and destroy. Abortion is a spiritual issue. It is a battle for life. Not just life of the preborn, but for the all-born. Life to the fullest. Why? Why would it be that? Because my favorite saint quote, St. Irenaeus, because the glory of God is us fully alive. He wants us to be fully alive. Obviously, abortion robs us of life, but not just life in the womb. It robs us of life to the full, abundant life as intended by Christ. It leaves scars, deep scars, on those who are victims of the notion that legal equals moral. But a lack of sexual integrity, whether that results in a crisis pregnancy or not, robs one of the fullness of the life God intends for those who love him. When I began working in pregnancy center ministry, um, <clears throat> we adopted a portion of Deuteronomy 30, 19 as our guiding scripture verse. That reads in part, now choose life so that you and your children may live. It seemed like an obvious choice. The first service we were going to offer, as I stated, was limited ultrasounds on abortion-minded and abortion-vulnerable women. The notion being, I should probably explain this, the notion being that a, di that a pregnancy diagnosis cannot be confirmed until a baby is seen in the uterus and with a beating heart. So limited ultrasounds determine those two things. So we expanded our clinic to include early prenatal care as well as testing and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases and infections. I had to ask the question then, does this scripture verse still apply as our medical mission verse? Well, in order to answer that question, I had to study Deuteronomy, all of chapter 30 specifically. So just bear with me, and I'm going to go through a little bit, just a little bit, um, of what that has taught me, realizing, of course, that to do this in true orthodox fashion, we would also study chapter 30 in the context of the entire book of Deuteronomy, and we would study Deuteronomy in the entire context of Scripture, and we would study Scripture within the contents of the context of the church. That's a whole new concept for a Protestant. <laughs> Speaking, I mean, for myself. Um, time doesn't permit that. So for the purposes of this workshop, let me just say Deuteronomy, second law, God is, again, through Moses, encouraging wholehearted fidelity from his people. He's still doing that today. In the previous chapter, 29, really throughout the book and all and many of the other books, God is reminding his people of his faithfulness and essentially explaining the importance of living within the covenant that he established for us, as well as the dangers of and the futility of living outside of that covenant. In chapter 30, God is encouraging his people, us. He is telling us in verses 1 through 3 that wherever we are, when we reflect in our heart and return to him, and obey his voice from our whole heart and from our whole soul that he will heal our sins, heal our sins, have mercy on us and gather us to him from wherever we may be. He tells us in verse 3 that he will heal our sins. Other versions of that have said he will have compassion on us. When we live in covenant with God, he has compassion on us. He gives us mercy and that heals us. In verse 6, he tells us 
that he will purify our hearts and the heart of our seed. He will purify our heart and the heart of our children. He will circumcise our hearts to love the Lord our God from our whole heart and from our whole soul. Why? So that we may live. He promises to take great care of us in all the work of our hand, in the offspring of our womb, in the produce of our land, even in the offspring of our cattle. I mean, God just blesses abundantly. He goes on to tell us that he will even rejoice over us just like he did our fathers. That part, for some reason, really, really um, melted my heart, that God might rejoice over me. I mean, that, that for me... Um, was a very intimate moment. He will do this if we obey the voice of the Lord our God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, and if we turn to the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul. There's a lot of if-then statements in Scripture. This is one of my favorites. And then he assures us that to love and obey him with all our hearts is not too difficult or lofty for us because his word is in our mouth and in our hearts and in our hands. Why? So that we may do it. So that we may obey him. So we call that synergy, right? God gives us what we need. We obey that. And we we live in synergy. We live in communion with God. The or, this word that he's talking about, the Orthodox Study Bible, has this wonderful footnote about this. This word concerning the attainment of righteousness before God is the word that casts out human reasoning and the supposed impossibilities raised by it. It is God's word sown in a believing heart, confessed with the mouth, and worked out by the hands. It doesn't matter that I'm not comfortable with this ministry. It didn't matter that I had no experience with it. God's word is implanted in me. I obey him and he gives me what I need. God makes it clear that the choice is ours. He even says, I set, see, I set before you today life and death, good and evil. And he asks us to obey him. And he also tells us what will happen if we don't. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear and go astray to serve different gods, you will perish. Seems pretty clear to me what choice to make, but it's amazing to me that I don't just intuitively always do that. And then he challenges us to obey him. He says to us, um, he puts he puts before us blessings and cursings, life and death, and then encourages us, choose life. And why? That both you and your descendants may live. And what does he mean to choose life? Here we go again. John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Abundant life. Abundant life. That's why he came. And how do we get it? By obeying him with our whole heart and with our whole soul, with all that we are. You know, everyone and anyone who has been touched by abortion is negatively affected. Everyone and anyone who has even been touched by abortion is negatively impacted. They're wounded by this. To expand this even further, anyone who has even had a pregnancy scare or been abused, neglected, been the victim of, or the perpetrator of an unhealthy or a sinful relationship, even been sexually active outside of the covenant of marriage, outside of the covenant that God has provided for us, suffers from the wounds of sexual brokenness, abuse, neglect, betrayal, humiliation, loneliness, isolation, despair. I'm sure anyone who has experienced this can add to the list. And just like all deep wounds, and these are deep wounds, I don't know of many things that wound as deeply as sexual wounds. They are subject to infection. They are most certainly going to become infected. Like I said before, these lie at the very core of our identity and they distort our intimate love relationship with God and with others. They distort the communion that God had intended for us. 
as a parenthetical but related thought, um, I guess it's no surprise that these are the very things, these sexual identity things are the very things that are at the core of the battle being waged today. Anyway, these wounds are deep and they are infected and that's what leads to this distortion. And I can tell you from personal and professional experience that these wounds do not heal without the proper medication. They just don't. They need to be cleansed by the tears of repentance. They need to be confessed and they need to be healed. But in this ministry, I'm sure in many others, we have found that many who suffer from this systemic illness believe themselves to be perfectly justified in suffering because look what I have done. Toxic shame, I heard it called in another workshop. I love that. Um, they believe that they deserve the guilt, the shame, the remorse. There's a couple of stories um, I would like to tell you about two very dear friends of mine. Uh, one I will call Laura. And Laura was in her mid-30s and was divorcing her husband of 10 years. A night of passion with this soon-to-be ex-husband led to a very unplanned pregnancy. She already had three children in this marriage, and she just didn't um, <clears throat> see a way clear to have a fourth, especially given that the marriage was breaking up, so she opted to have an abortion. Although she was convinced it was the right thing to do, she felt immediate, and I will add, long-lasting regret over that decision and subsequent action. Today is 37 years later. Laura was raised as a Catholic. She still identifies herself as such. She has confessed her sin of abortion too many times to count. She has talked with me and several others about her guilt and her shame and her remorse, and she refuses to accept the forgiveness that God offers a repentant sinner. So at the age of 72, Laura continues to be entangled in unhealthy relationships, just concluded another divorce. Her grown children are ensnared with this generational bondage as they struggle in their relationships. And Laura drinks a lot. Please pray for her. Lisa, on the other hand, is a 52-year-old mother of four living children. Um, she is in a loving, committed marriage of more than 35 years, but she has a past, a past from which she and her family have been redeemed. When Lisa was 20 or 21 years old, she opted to have an abortion when she discovered she was pregnant with her then boyfriend. This was a decision which, in spite of numerous confessions, she continued to experience guilt and shame. Seven years ago, with the help of godly friends and warriors in post-abortion ministry, Lisa accepted, Lisa accepted the forgiveness offered by God. She has been forgiven and set free of the bondage intended by the enemy of God and of our souls. And she is able now to live life to the fullest. And in doing that, she helps others struggle with the shame, the guilt, and the remorse caused by the sin of abortion. Nothing is unforgivable by a holy God who showers his mercy on repentant sinners. There are people in every grocery store, every school, every club, every church who suffers from abortion, sexual brokenness, relationship dysfunction. I will also tell you that um, in Orthodox churches, we are told that this sin is kept far more secret than in others. That we have, because of the cultural um, component to our church, that the familial ties are so strong that, the, that young women don't want to disappoint. But they need the healing love of a savior to know that they can be forgiven. Forgiven and set free from the bondage of guilt, shame, and remorse that this sin, that all sin, causes. But in order for that to happen, we have to choose life. 
In crisis pregnancy ministry, of course, this means life of the preborn, but it also means choosing life in every area of our life. Sexually, yes. To live a life of sexual integrity is a life that honors God. But we also need to choose life with our finances, in our marriages and in our homes, with our finances, at work and at play, our thoughts, words, and deeds, and with our finances. Yes, I know I said finances <laughs> several times. Remember, I am the parish chairperson of a parish that is building after a fire. Let me just say that this experience is teaching me the difficulty and the importance of sanctifying our finances. Everything belongs to God. Holy things are for the holy. In every aspect of our life, we need to choose life. Choosing life is actually what heals that wound, no matter how infected it may have been. We must surrender if we are to be healed. We have to choose life. This surrendering is frightful, excruciating even, because we want to protect ourselves, guard against the pain. We want to hold on to the fig leaves that keep us clothed before a mighty God. But this kind of healing can only come by way of the wound. In, the incarnate, in meeting the incarnate God, we are told that surrendering means to be wounded by disclosure. That's what we need to do. That's what I have found I need to do in all areas of my life. Pregnancy Center Ministry was the vehicle through which I learned that. And so we have to ask ourselves the question that Jesus himself asked the paralytic um, at the Pool of Bethesda. My favorite question in all of Scripture, do you want to be well? If our answer to that is a resounding yes, the next step is obedience. If it is yes, but, or I'm not sure, or even no, then we need to pray until it is an unqualified yes. What I have found, certainly in pregnancy center ministry, but in all my yeses to God, is that when I do that, when I say yes, he is faithful. St. Luke tells us just how faithful he will be. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. God is a God of abundance. He wants abundant life for us. And I can also tell you that the opposite of this is true. When I don't say yes to God, I suffer the consequences of that. Until I am a participant in divine synergy, I'm like Jonah in the boat, causing everyone around me to suffer. Just ask my husband. Until I go overboard and finally relent to the will of God. I will tell you that my journey into orthodoxy is a great example of that. I came kicking and screaming, and it was the best thing that's ever happened to me. <clears throat> According to our tradition, grace and free will are expressed concurrently. One is not expressed without the other. At the moment we choose life, at that very moment, divine grace synergizes and vivifies us. St. Gregory of Nyssa explains this beautifully. He says, The grace of God is not able to visit those who flee salvation, nor is human virtue of such power as to be adequate of itself to raise up to authentic life those souls who are untouched by grace. But when righteousness of works and the grace of the Spirit come together at the same time in the same soul, together they are able to be filled with they are able to fill it with blessed life as i said crisis pregnancy ministry has been one of those lenses through which god has revealed to me the necessity for and the benefit of obedience one of the many synergistic manifestations in my life. This has been true in so many cases in my life, in my recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction, even the good stuff, my, like I said, my journey into, into the Orthodox faith, my chrismation. We have a Bible study that has met in our home for the last several years where blessing upon blessing just keeps coming through that study, and I fought that. I didn't want to do that, and God blesses it. And like I told you before, the parish council. I could tell you stories upon stories about my yeses to God. I'm sure you could, too. 
Because what we are told by the saints and what has been true in my spiritual journey is that God calls me to minister in the places of my extreme brokenness. The areas of wounding become the very vehicle through which healing occurs. St. Theophon the Recluse, again, tells us that every Christian has the power to heal infirmities, not of others, but his own, and not of the body, but of the soul. This, that is, sins and sinful habits. And to cast out of devils, cast out devils, rejecting evil thoughts sown by them and extinguishing the excitement of passions inflamed by them. Do this, he says, and you will be an apostle, a fulfiller of what the Lord chose for you, an accomplisher of your calling as a messenger. When at first you succeed in all this, then perhaps the Lord will appoint you as a special ambassador to save others after you have saved yourself and to help those who are tempted after you yourself pass through all temptations and through all experiences in good and evil. Then he goes on to say, but your job is to work upon yourself. For this, you are chosen. The rest is in the hands of God. St. Nikolai Vlimirovich says, in agreement with this, if your heart has been softened, either by repentance before God or by learning the boundless love of God towards you, do not be proud with those whose hearts are still hard. Remember how long your heart was hard and incorrigible. And if you come to feel that God has given you better health than others, know that it is given through mercy, so in health you may serve your frailer brothers. The greatest truth about us, says Father John Breck, is that God has created us with a profound longing, a burning thirst for communion with him. He can easily, we can easily pervert that longing into an idolatrous quest for something other than God, leading to sexual brokenness and all kinds of other things. Yet God remains faithful, even in our times of apostasy, like the father of the prodigal son. He always awaits our return. He, once we begin that journey homeward through repentance and an ongoing struggle against our worst inclinations, God reaches out to embrace and to heal all that is broken and wasted. He reaches out to restore within us the sublime image in which we were made. I can attest to that, at least in part. My obedience has allowed me to witness and participate in the miracle of life, not just life in the womb, although that's enough, but of, of, of life abundantly, life as promised by Jesus Christ. This kind of life is possible only by doing violence to my own desires, my need for perceived comfort and safety, my natural inclinations, my preferences, my dreams, and my nightmares, all of it. Bless you. Thank you. Only when the desires of God become more important than my own is true communion with him and with others possible. And I learned that in part, in large part, through Pregnancy Center Ministry. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Do you have questions, comments? I have brought some um, some information from Zoe for Life. Our newsletter's over there. Please feel free to take it. Our pamphlet's over there. Please don't take the fetal models. So. <laughs> pick them up. Mm-hmm. The fetal, pick them up. The fetal oh, models. yes. They don't do any good if they just sit in the box. <laughs> that they is true. They feel just like, yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah. Oh, I, does I, she need to come? Oh, oh. I'll let you get Try to use my good projecting voice. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have a hundred questions, but I'm going to just try to limit it to one. And, and I apologize because this will sound like it's a bit of a stumper question, but, um, you know, I'm just going to guess that of all of us in the room, by far, you have the most experience in dealing with women who have had all manner of crisis pregnancies and off the top of my head you know 
this baby was conceived because I was sexually trafficked. I shouldn't have to bear this child. This child is a product of rape. I'm 14 years old. Mm-hmm. I'm in poverty. Um, you've encountered every one of these in a thousand other cases. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, most of us in the room are either therapists or priests or, um, you know, ministers or people who have other ways of, of, of connecting with people, doctors, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wonder if you could give us a few words of wisdom to help guide us, because when that woman comes and is in front of us, even just at coffee hour in church, <laughs> saying, I'm in, I'm in this challenging pregnancy and I don't know what to do, mm-hmm. any words for us on how we should respond to that woman kind of in that moment? Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for starting with an easy one. I appreciate that. (laughs) Uh, I will tell you that one of the benefits, um, the luxuries that we have at Zoe and um, and what we utilize um, is the gift of relationship. So we don't give her all the answers right then and there. We enter into whatever it is that's going on with her. We hurt with her. Um, Some of the stories, even just recalling them, bring me to tears. So we enter into relationship with her, and we walk that journey with her. One of, we have found that one of the most important things that we can do, I mean, we're not professionals, we're peer mentors. I want to make that very clear. If they need professionals, we, we refer for that. Um, but one of the things that we can do is walk that journey with her. We assure her that she will never be alone. She will not be alone, that we will walk that with her. And in that, in that initial, I will tell you, in that initial appointment, What we do is first say to her, are you sure that you're pregnant? We need to make sure that you're pregnant. That's what this whole medical piece is about. Um, Because a lot of, um, there are false positive pregnancy tests, you know, and until you see that baby with that beating heart in the uterus, we don't know for sure, so we start there. Um, I have actually witnessed firsthand the miracle of that. You know, just seeing the baby in the uterus, seeing that beating heart changes a mama's heart. Um, But not always. Certainly not always, and and we have heard some very tragic stories, and and we have lost some babies. Um, I'm rem- and and one of one of the I will t- this is a little off topic, but one of the redemptive um, portions of this ministry, at least for me, is that if we scan a baby and mom still chooses abortion, at least we witnessed to that life. We met that life. We saw that life. Um, so it, 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 it was significant for us. Um, but for the most part, where we start is in assuring her that this, she will not be walked through this alone. Um, and then we start from there. There's a lot of stuff I could add to that, but I will say that that's where we start. And, and at coffee hour, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask about the, I imagine, and I, I don't know this from experience with people I know, but just from the stories I hear that, that most cases of people trying to discern whether or not they are going to get an abortion just come from places of, of deep pain, uh, of deep suffering. And the, I mean, the, as, as you presented, well, the theology is clear on, on how we handle it, but it's, it's, and as you also said, coming advising in a way that brings about guilt or that brings about a uh, kind of a sense of obligation just scares people away mm-hmm. um, and makes people feel like they can't come th- through with their true problems. And so from your experience in, in ministering to people, how do we minister to people in a way that allows us to recognize their pain and the difficulty, even though we know where, where it should end up, how do we recognize that pain with them? And without, and guide them fruitfully. Um, one of one of the things that we are always sure to tell them, um, if we have um, if we have a woman who's leaving us and her she is still abortion minded, meaning that's where she's going from from us. What we are sure to tell her is we still want to be here for you because after an abortion, this is not over. This is not over. And it's perfectly normal for people who've had abortions to struggle with this decision for a long time afterwards. Please know that we care about you. One of the things that um, that we really had to um, to get our heads around is that it wasn't just about saving babies. You know, even if mom makes a tragic decision, we still want her to come back to God, 
you know, that he can still forgive that. So is that is that what you were referring to? Was the loss of the baby or how? That and generally, mm-hmm. like just mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, because because what what we at Zoe want, and I think what we all want, is is for those we come in contact with to be able to live life to the fullest. And we know that there is nothing unforgivable um, if we repent, you know. And so we gently lead them in that repentance. I will tell you a story of one of our friends that we had no idea. This is back when I was working at um, at Pregnancy Choices. And they have a fundraising banquet every year. And we invited people to come with us every year. We had a table of people for that. And unbeknownst to us, one of the couples that we invited, the woman in that in that marriage had had an abortion. And we didn't know that. And she burst into tears in that in that banquet. Um, and she has subsequently been able to um, to receive healing for that. But we don't know who the hurting are. Um, another another one of my of my dear friends. Um, I would call her one of my one of my closest, most intimate friends. I was on a board at another pregnancy center before Zoe, and we needed a um, an office manager, and she was perfect for the job. So I t- I suggested to her she might want to go talk to the uh, to the um, executive director, which she did. One of the questions in the interview is, "Have you ever suffered an abortion?" She breaks down into tears because she had. I didn't know that. That was not a secret that she was going to share with me just then. Um, and she has received healing for that. So we never, we just never know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy, what a powerful testimony and what a blessed mi- ministry that, that you're a part of. Um, so if obedience is a is a virtue and pride is is a sin that we're we're all guilty of you know one of the big speaking points about the right to choose side is that you know a woman it's her body and she has the should have that right to make these kind of reproductive choices it is almost like you're on two separate planets when you look at what truly being human is from an orthodox perspective and where they're coming from. Is that really a reality that you encounter when you meet these women? Or is that just uh, propaganda that that this is, you know, what where they're coming from? You know, when, when you really are in that moment, you're trying to look at that beating heart on an ultrasound, do you experience that these women who, who might have come from a stance of, you know, this is a choice I'm making, they just melt in seeing that? I mean, it, I feel like it's it, it's really hard to have that conversation when we come from two separate places. Mm-hmm. What a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, we first of all, what we have to do is meet them where we are, <laughs> where they are. Um, and and hence the purpose of the ultrasound. It serves that purpose. Um, I, w- I will tell you, in answer to that um, question, has an ultrasound ever just, you know, immediately, again, uh, back at the center where I worked, we were doing an ultrasound on a young woman <clears throat> who had, um, she was 10 weeks pregnant by the time we did the ultrasound. Her mom was in the room with us. Her mom burst into tears and said, they told me it was only tissue. They told me it was only tissue. She was an abortion, a victim of abortion. So, it, it, you know, you never know. You never know who your client's going to be either. So, yeah, I have. I have also seen that happen. I've also seen that happen with clients themselves. Um, there's something about that beating heart that gets them too. Um, I will tell you at least, at least, theoretically, that argument that you make, you know, about it's a women's a woman's body. Um, we have that pretty regularly um, in our own family because uh, we have some um, daughters and stepdaughters who. Um, who have that argument. And at that time, it's only a hypothetical, you know, and it falls apart the more we talk about it with them. Um, and, I, and I am sure that that is the delusion of the enemy that makes that kind of behavior acceptable. You know, that's what we have to believe. Those, and we're told that, you know, those of us who live outside, outside of God's covenant are living in delusion. So everything's up for grabs at that point. Well, and, and the fact that it's a delusion, it's this... 
pretend freedom, yes. but after the act, you are yoked mm-hmm. by this. Yeah, you are yoked by this. That's exactly right. And to those who say, you know, they're pro-choice, I love that. God tell God's pro-choice. He tells us choose life. <laughs> we found that out in Deuteronomy. We have a choice. The choice is life, life to the fullest. That's a, that's a tough choice. Great questions. Any others? Okay. Thank you all very much.